Good. Okay, we got it. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get going right just a minute or two here. All right, it is 7.02. I like to be punctual. Uh, so we're gonna get going. I wanna really welcome all of you tonight. We were getting a pretty good crowd coming in here and we got an exciting show. Welcome to the Rally for Our Water. I'm Dave Sly with Wild Virginia. And I want you to note on screen our uh, great co-host for this event. Lots of great organizations who are strong allies in the fight to stop the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Uh, we want to do two things tonight. We want to inspire and energize you, whether you're a longtime pipeline fighter or whether you're new to this, we want to, to help uh, energize you and get you going for the next stage. Uh, and then we're going to tell you specifically how you can do that, how you can take action that's going to be effective and help stop this thing. Um, if you wanna ask questions, you can go to the Q&A uh, button at the bottom, type in your questions and uh, somebody will get to those. If you have any technical problems uh, with your connection or whatever, you can email misty, M-I-S-T-Y at wildvirginia.org or call her at 434-971-1553. Uh, and then the last thing, we're, we're recording this and we're going to make it available. So if you've missed part of it or if you've got friends you want to share it with, be sure to look for that. Um, so now, uh, why is this the right time for doing this? Why did, why did we call this uh, meeting now? Um, it's really important to know that there are some really vital decisions that are coming up. Uh, specifically, the Virginia State Water Control Board, which is the regulatory body that makes very serious decisions like this pipeline's fight, is going to make a decision in December. And we need to tell them in the strongest terms that this should not happen, that they must not let MVP uh, dig and blast through hundreds of our, our vital water bodies. Um, we still have a lot of valuable and sensitive places that we can still save despite any damage that's already started. And do not believe their line that this is a done deal, that we're, that we're finished. We have a lot more to do. Um, and again, we're gonna give you very specific information about next steps that you can take. Um, so we have a, a whole lineup of exciting speakers, Really, really great guest. And I'm gonna start turning that over. Jessica Sims from Appalachian Voices is gonna introduce for us our first great speaker. Dave, thank you so much. Again, I'm Jessica Sims, a Virginia field coordinator for Appalachian Voices. So happy to be here with all of y'all tonight and so thankful for your attendance. I am honored to introduce our first speaker, Crystal Cavalier Keck. She's a citizen of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation in Burlington, North Carolina, and is the co-founder of Seven Directions of Service with her husband, Jason Keck. She's a national figure in the fight against MVP and its proposed Southgate extension. An organizer with the Indigenous Environmental Network, chair of the Environmental Justice Committee for the NAACP, a board member of the Haw River Assembly, she is also working on her doctorate focusing on missing and murdered indigenous women in frontline communities that are facing gas and oil pipeline projects. Crystal is a teacher, a leader, and a truly welcoming organizer in the fight against the MVP. Welcome, Crystal. 
Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so Mikuta Min Chin Kiyohe, Nahon PP say, Mima Crystal, Mima Okanichi Saponi Watiwa. So um, I'm calling in from the Palala tribes here in Seattle, Washington. And um, we are three hours behind you guys. So I made sure I could be here. So thank you so much. And I just want to speak briefly about, um, you know, my fight in the MVP. So we live on the end part at the MVP South Gate. And we've been fighting this since 2018. I resigned from my tribal um, council so I could fight the MVP. And um, I felt I could do much more service to the citizens as you know a fighter, um, because oftentimes you guys see that tribal nations want to, I guess, um, connect with FERC or try to have this nation to nation government. And I just felt that I, I would be in the way and I didn't want to stand in my tribe sovereignty. So my husband and I, we've been fighting this pipeline and we recently wanted to get the MVP in the national spotlight because that is where it is needed. A lot of people need to know about this. Um, I felt that if we didn't get it into the national narrative that this pipeline would just sneak through. And so my husband and I, we started working with a lot of indigenous environmental network. We worked with Dallas Goldtooth and Mary Crow from the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And we did a um, water walk on May the 2nd. And um, it was really helpful. Jess helped out, Russell, everybody on this call, everybody helped out. And we had a really good turnout because we wanted to just get the communities involved because it is you know, our voices that's going to be heard. And we wanted to bring up these environmental degradations that's been happening, um, you know, from felling of the trees, you know, all of this sediment that's going into the, the lakes and the rivers. And, you know, my tribe originally, we were, we had an island out in the Roanoke uh, River right before you get to uh, Car Lake. And, um, you know, of course, the Army Corps of Engineers they flooded our island. So now our homelands are underwater. And so, you know, water is very vital to our people, to everywhere, because without water, you just can't live. And, you know, that's what we want to bring up. And we want to connect people because it, you know, it's a, it's everybody's fight because everybody needs water. Everybody needs air. Everybody needs, you know, the right to, to live. And um, I just, want everybody to know that we have to sign this petition um, with Appalachian Voices, and I'm pretty sure that someone will put it in the chat. Um, and we also want you guys to write these comments by October the 27th. You need to submit these comments to DEQ, and you need to tell them why it is important to say no to this pipeline. Um, and then finally, we want you to sign up and make comments at the online hearing that we're hosting on October the 25th. It's called the People's Hearing for the MVP. And I mean, all of this is real important. Um, this is the way that we can stop this. Um, and we have to do all of these grassroots efforts to get our voices heard. Because as you guys know, Virginia is just being hardheaded and stubborn in their um man, I don't know, in their decision-making processes, just even listening to the citizens. And, you know, I, I'm always quick to bring up like, hey, you're not listening to us. And, you know, we are electing you to represent us and they're, they're not doing a really good job. And, you know, I'm, you know, I think we need to call them out on it. And so, um, you know, I'm always quick to tell them like, hey, you know, be like North Carolina, even though North Carolina kind of was weak in their statement, um, at least they did say no to it. And, you know, we're holding, I'm making sure I'm holding their feet to the fire because we just cannot let this happen. This cannot continue to go through. Um, it is, it is just detrimental. And I don't care if they cover it up, whatever, it is still dangerous, right? Like frat gas is just horrible. It has a lot of chemicals, um, and I mean, we're all going to, you know, be affected by this. You know, our future generations will be affected by this pipeline. And this is something that people have to stand up and take a choice. They have to stand up now because we don't get a second chance at having another earth. 
um, or another anything. And once water or the air quality is gone, that's it, it's gone. Um, so I just thank you guys so much. I'm gonna give back five minutes because you guys have a really good lineup. Um, and I just wanna thank you so much. And I guess I will see you guys on this fight. Um, and you can reach out to me anytime, find my email and, you know, let me come up and let me talk to everybody because everybody has to know. So thank you guys so much for doing this. And um, I love you all. Pila Hook. Thank you, Crystal, so much. That was beautiful. And we will certainly be calling on you uh, for, for more. Uh, you're an inspirational speaker. And we need all the viewpoints. That's one thing that we're insisting on that uh, DEQ is not as good at. Uh, but now I have the privilege to, uh, to introduce Roberta Kellum. Um, Roberta, as you'll see on screen here, was a member of the Virginia State Water Control Board for two terms. Um, you can see her other qualifications, but I'll tell you on a personal level that having watched that Water Control Board for about 40 years now, uh, she was an inspiration. She was one of the folks who was willing to ask the hard questions and willing to make hard decisions and to, to really stand up for the citizens whom this citizen board is supposed to represent. And so I'm, I'm really proud that you've come to join us, Roberta, and please take it away. Thank you, David. Um, thank you for asking me to speak tonight and congratulations to you and to everybody who's um, still here, still fighting, still fighting the good fight to stop this disastrous Mountain Valley pipeline. You're still doing the work that DEQ and the governor should be doing, looking out for Virginia's waters and impacted communities. I've been reflecting back on my time on the State Water Control Board, and it was actually early December 2017 when the State Water Control Board held the public hearing on the water quality certification for the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Maybe some of you were there that afternoon when Nisa Dean and I voted against issuing the permit for the pipeline due to the obvious negative impacts to Virginia's streams, lakes, and groundwater. Information that helped my decision-making process was actually the input from the public, or as the DEQ leadership would say, and I'm not gonna mention his name, the opposition. <laughs> during, he only said that in closed doors, of course. Um, anyhow, during my time on the State Water Control Board, board members were told only that information that DEQ wanted us to know. Without any site-specific evidence, DEQ advised the board members that we should find a reasonable assurance. Remember those words, the reasonable assurance that the Mountain Valley pipeline construction would not harm the local water quality. It was the public that brought the scientific expertise to the board's attention, demonstrating that the soil could not in fact be kept on the mountainside when it rains and once the ve vegetation was removed. After reviewing the environmental impact statement and the information provided by the public, I knew there was no way that DEQ could be correct. In fact, as soon as the water quality certification was issued, DEQ issued ill-advised variances to the erosion and sedimentation control plans, which made it even more likely that water quality would be impacted. Not long after construction started, it rained as we thought it would, and immediately the erosion and stormwater management plans failed. Numerous streams were impacted by silt and sediment. DEQ brought an enforcement action only after hundreds of water quality violations were noted. By late 2018, it was clear that DEQ really didn't have the capacity to protect the local waters in the path of the pipeline whether it was from the standpoint of manpower or technical expertise. It happened just as the public predicted. So here we are again, recycling the same failed strategy of the past. I hope that today's State Water Control Board will listen to the public this time and do their own research into the full spectrum of impacts 
to Virginia's environment from the Mountain Valley Pipeline. To all of you who are listening today, please continue to speak up to the State Water Control Board and let them know how this project will impact water quality. That is truly the only honest information they will receive. There are many ways to have your voices heard. David um, and Jessica can go through the list of options, speaking at the, the people's hearing, sending in comment letters, um, but please, please continue to speak up and, and let your voices be heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roberta. And You're we, welcome. Uh, we can certainly uh, hope and work to try to convince those uh, current board members to uh, exercise the kind of judgment and responsibility you did. And uh, we're going to be hard at that. And you mentioned we are going to tell people the specifics about how to, how to make those comments. Um, so now I get to uh, turn this over to Russell Chisholm from Power who's going to introduce uh, an important speaker. Thank you, David. Thank you, Roberta and Crystal. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, the strength and perseverance of our coalition is exemplified by our next speaker. Don Jones carries on the legacy of his dad, George, not only as a careful steward of the land, but as an advocate for everyone downstream over the many years of the struggle against Mountain Valley Pipeline. We have marched together, testified in hearings, and we will continue to rally to the cause for our neighbors together, not just here in, in Giles County, but all along the route. Thank you, Don, for coming here to share your story tonight, and you have the floor. You're muted, Don. There you go. Oh, sorry, okay. Am I good? Okay, thank you very much, Russell, for the nice words. Um, the only good that I can say that has come from the pipeline fight is uh, we've earned and gained a lot of friends met a lot of good people outside of that i'm not seeing a bit of good that's going that's coming from it or will come from it um but my name's donald jones and <clears throat> i'm generation seven of the adelaide jones farm family <clears throat> uh farm in giles county greater newport um and we've we established there in the late 1700s um, and we've uh, been stewards of the land and I, we feel like the reason that we that they established there originally is because of the mountain springs uh, on our properties there were three mountain springs and one sp lower spring that feeds into sinking creek the billy spring um, it's 38 degree water uh, it's like an artesian well. It's just pumping massive amounts of water into the sinking creek. Um, when I was a little kid, there would always be a drinking cup there and one up at the head of the spring. Um, that's just what we did. We'd go up to the head of the spring and get a drink of water. Um, they, and when my dad inherited his track, he had a choice of different tracks. And um, he chose the track with the spring on it. And I, I, we didn't really understand, you know, I was like, dad, why, you know, the better building spot is probably the track up above. He said, no, we got to protect our water. He goes, uh, without water, you, you can't have your livestock. You can't survive. So he lived, it. He, he knew that they had to have water to, to survive. He was very protective caregiver of it. Uh, when, when he heard of the Mountain Valley Pipeline <clears throat> coming through the property, he knew exactly what was at stake. Um, not only the devastation to the land, but to his water. Um, and he, he stood a strong ground on, on uh, fighting it. Um, you know, there were days that we went out on every survey with him and 
And one day I told dad, I was like, dad, you know, I think that we've done all we can do. They're not listening. They don't care. And he turned to me and said, son, he said, you haven't lost the war until you lost the battle. And he said, we hadn't lost the battle. We're still fighting. He said, as long as I'm standing, we're fighting this. I'm like, okay, dad, I'll be right there with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. But so, so we, we have fought it. We went on, um, I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, but try to make some points. We, Mountain Valley does not care. Uh, on the wetland survey, we met with the surveyors. We asked them what the procedure of this was gonna be. The guy says, well, you know, I can look right here on my laptop. You don't have any wetlands here, so it's gonna be pretty easy. And, my, and of course we got the mountain spring and the runoff does run off on another piece of property now that's not my dad's. But my dad's like, well, we do have wetlands and when it rains, this is a 300 acre watershed. There's nowhere for the water to go, but down this mountain and it fills into the sinkholes, which we assume disperses to the sinking creek. And so I have a little video that you can kind of see that that proved them wrong. But as far as I know, they told FERC that there's no wetlands. And my understanding at the DEQ meeting, David um, Peller, I think is the head of it. He, he said that they were gonna protect the upstream wetlands, which would be our property because we're up on the mountainside, I assume. And he would let the car, uh, Army <coughs> Corps of Engineers take care of the streams. But um, you can see in the video that did not happen. Um, and, and so in Mount Valley, they, they will tell you, I'm gonna give you an example. We testified in federal court that, um, we testified in federal court or that, or they testified, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, Mr. Cooper, testified in federal court that they had to take our land early. You know, they were taking an eminent domain, but we hadn't sold to them. So they sued 300 of us and with an intimidating summons about two inches thick. So we showed up in court and they were asking the judge, hey, these people wouldn't sell us right away. So we want early entry on the property. And so his reasoning was this, the pike couldn't lay out more than six months. And, and technically they just put the pipe in the ground this year, middle of summer, and the date on the pipe is uh, 2017. So what I'm getting at, Mountain Valley will tell even a federal judge anything to push his project through. They have no concern for private property. They don't care about your water. They don't live here. They have no concerns whatsoever of the state of Virginia, but they will tell them whatever they need to so they can make money. And that's just one example of it. And so they're going to DEQ and, and I've been to the water board meetings and all and listen to what they've had to say. And I've never heard them say anything other than they need to hurry up and get it done because erosion sediment or they need to keep their jobs. But what they really should be telling them is what they really wanna do. What they want to do to our streams is they want to dig pits so they can bore under them and use, I don't think they're bringing their own water with them. They want to use thousands, hundreds of thousands of gallons of our pristine mountain water for their drilling rigs, turn it into slurry, mucky, toxic mess and give it back to us, let it sit there and then reuse it in the bore pit to fill, fill it in when they're done. That's what they should be telling the water board. That's what they really wanna do, but they're just not saying it. And so we need everybody to get on board and comment if I've done it and I'm the worst, uh, you know, this, this is not what I do, but I fight the fight. Everybody's comment makes a difference. You, you may think that you know, I'm not educated enough. Um, I don't have the specifics on or whatever. Comment from your heart, what's right, what's wrong. And 
get those comments in. Um, I'm sure people uh, they'll share with you how to do that. I, I don't have all the information to give you to, how to do that. Um, if Misty can maybe try my video, see if it'll work. And maybe people can kind of see the good and bad. I'm going to try to run it for you right now. Yeah, there's a lot more bad than good, but we'll see if it see if it'll play. Let's see if it'll go for you. There, there's the upstream water that they that I felt like we were failed on by the DEQ. And the Mountain Valley said this water wasn't there. And this this is just one incident that that the DEQ doesn't even know about. That out of all the violations that they've been fined for, they don't even know about this one. It makes me really sad. There's our summons to court. <clears throat> it's sink a picture of Sinking Creek. There's the pipeline on our land. It's been laying there for, it laid there for two years. And they testified in federal court that they had to have it in the ground within six months. They had to take our property. So no just compensation. And, and what is just compensation? They just want to pay you what forest land is, no consideration for trees or any other thing. And, and I'd like to say that also that, am I still up? Yep, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. And I, I'd like to say that, um, you know, the DEQ sent me a letter in the mail giving us notice of the hearing that you can comment. But there's so many people that didn't get that letter that would be concerned citizens. The family that's at Green Hill Park in the summer, their kids playing in the river. Uh, my son's employee that fishes in the river. They would have liked to know that Mountain Valley is wanting to pollute the water that they enjoy and, and play in. So it leaves, leaves us being the voice for many. So many people do not know about this. Thank, thankful for organizations like Wild Virginia that that make it more broadly known. But the DEQ has not done a good job. They should have sent mailers out to all affected downstream people that might have a concern that their water is going to be completely contaminated by this boring understreams wallowing around in muck and taking our clean water free of charge and giving it back to us in a slurry, toxic, mucky, mucky mess. It's ridiculous. And, and I don't understand why the water board, I, I always thought they were for the citizens. I thought they, and it seems like that when you go in there, it's intimidation. You have state police everywhere. When I went to Richmond, 
I thought I was in the wrong parking lot. I thought I was at a state police convention. I had to go in there and ask. It, it was just unbelievable that I'm like, I don't understand. I can't understand what's going on here. Why, why the water board makes me feel like that they're against me or, or something. I, I don't understand that. And they should be the ones they're the ones that should be protecting our water. They're appointed for the citizens to, to be our voice, to tell them what, we, what we're saying. I've heard one resident, a Giles County board supervisor got up there and he was in favor of them to finish his project so that he could get his field restored so he could continue on farming. Well, we tried to get him on board long before that. And if he would have, he wouldn't have had this damage to start with. But he's the only one that I've heard that wants his project to go forward. Other than the Mountain Valley Pipeline employees and Roanoke Gas that got 1% of the gas to make it more in, in a domain legal for the public use. They basically gave them 1% so they could take our land. So it, you know, I hope the water board will listen to the comments, the DEQ. I hope everybody will take time out and make a comment. You don't have to be, even if you think your voice doesn't matter, it does. Just a small comment. You say, please protect our water or just something simple. Every, every comment will help. That's great, Don. Thank you so much. Um, yes. I'm not very smooth. I apologize for that. Um, this is not a speaking contest. It's a it's a time to talk to your neighbors and your friends and your allies. And yeah. you you give me strength, and so do all the other people out there who kind of in the, been in the bullseye. This thing, uh, you know, we some of us who get to do this full time, I, I consider it a, a blessing. Uh, I consider it a gift that I get to do this. Um, and uh, we're glad to work for people like you. I want to play off on a couple of things you said. I don't know that I cut you off. I, I was just going to say, as my dad would say, I sure like to have a good glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to uh, follow up on a couple things Don said, because I think they're yes. really important for the, for the process going forward. One is that there is no question that the people out there on the land who care about it, who have looked after it, who depend on it, know more about it than anybody. And, you know, there are folks at DEQ who are, who are good technical people. There are people who have a lot of data. Uh, but they don't know where all those things are. You talked about springs, and there's many, many instances where those things have just been missed. Uh, yes. Yeah, but also the kind of impacts that have already been happened, um, they just have not been acknowledged the way that they should. The other thing that you said that is really important is very often people come to me and they say, well, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a policy person. What do I say? I don't, you know, they, they don't care what I had to say. And the thing is that we have lawyers and we have scientists and we have engineers and we've got them lined up. But the other thing we need is the people who know and depend on and use those waters. Like you say, it's the folks who water their, their cattle. It's the folks who fish and swim and just the folks who want to see the beautiful, you know, Stony Creek or, you know, the North Fork Roanoke or whatever it happens to be. And you, if you're in that category, if you're one of those people who thinks I don't have anything to say, uh, you're wrong because the Clean Water Act and our laws are supposed to protect those things that, that, that are valuable to you. Yes. Um, the Water Control Board is going to make a decision whether water quality standards can be can be upheld if this thing goes poured. And the fact is that anytime your waters are going to be damaged, your use, your enjoyment of those waters is going to be degraded, then water quality standards cannot be met. 
So I just want, I like to make that link between the real world experiences of people and what they have to live with and what the law says. Yeah. Because you will hear the EQ say, well, yeah, that's all just opinion and that's all just, um, you know, um, they like to use the word anecdotal. Well, your knowledge of what happens on your, your spring is right. evidence. It's hard, important evidence. And again, it's the same for everybody who knows about these places. So that's just an, another pitch for any of you, whatever your viewpoint, whatever your knowledge, where you come from, that matters. And I just want to point out that as we said, we're going to have this people's hearing. It's on October 25th, starting at 6 p.m. And we'll go as long as we need to go. Uh, the process has traditionally been really hard for people to play their role in. And we don't accept that. And we're not going to allow that to be the status quo. Um, the two in-person hearings were great. I'm glad that people got to attend, but a lot of us didn't feel safe doing that. And a lot of people don't, it's not easy for them to go to these things. So that's why we're doing this people's hearing. And um, so we are prepared. And I say we, it's not Wild Virginia, it's, it's, it's everybody who is strong in, in unity on this thing. We're prepared to do the job uh, and to take this forward. So thanks, Don. I, you gave me the chance to, to give a little sermon there, which Thank you, know, David. people know I'll always take advantage of that chance. Um, <laughs> but um, now we're going to move on to, um, and, and again, I'm very honored to be able to introduce Corinna Gore. Um, you know, I reached out to Corinna about this and about the, you know, the idea of her stepping into this situation again. And she instantly said, yes. Um, you know, I, again, I can talk about her, her credentials, which are impressive. Um, but to me, more important is, you know, the, the people aspect of this thing. Corinna has been showing up just like a lot of other people, she's showed up on, on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. She showed up on the MVP. She's willing to use her voice and her influence and her, and her knowledge to, to make this thing, uh, to make this fight better, to make it stronger, to support all of us. Uh, I just point out again, she's founder and director of the Center for Earth Ethics. And I think it's important to point out how much this is an ethical and a justice issue. It's an injustice for people and the land to be treated in the way that they're willing to treat it. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Corinna and thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, it's been uh, wonderful connecting with you. Um, I have really appreciated the conversations that I've been able to have with, with you and with others who are on this call in this gathering who've been fighting this fight for many years so hard. I'm very moved by the other speakers. Um, thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Don. Um, very honored to be part of, of this program and, uh, and humbled um, to follow uh, those powerful words. So I'm going to add my voice. I'm going to speak a little bit about the history of the Clean Water Act, which is uh, what gives us this particular lever that's coming up uh, in terms of the comments to the State Water Control Board. And then also a little bit about the current state of the climate crisis. And most of all, just about the values and the ethics that underlie all of this, this whole movement um, and this important decision. I really believe that if everyone stands behind the water right now, uh, taking these three actions that you all have so wisely and clearly laid out, this pipeline will be defeated. And I also believe that it can be a watershed moment. It can really lead the way uh, for a shift 
in a sense of what's possible uh, for this whole country. And of course, for, for, for all the, the earth, which is affected, uh, the aggregate of all these little projects is of course what's causing what we can all see around us, these wildfires and floods and extreme weather events and so on. So although this is a very particular project, this is a powerful group of people here right now because it's all connected in that way. So thank you for giving me some time to share. Um, a couple of days ago, we marked the 49th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. David Sly was the person that told me about that. I didn't even know that was coming, but thank you. Um, and it's a really interesting history. So it was enacted on October 18th, 1972. And it was after President Nixon vetoed it. So I didn't know that either until I went back and looked at this history. Actually, Congress overrode a veto by President Richard Nixon, and they did it in a bipartisan way with people of different part of both parties coming together. So how did this come about? So the principal sponsor of the Clean Water Act was a man named Edward uh, Edmund Muskie, um, who was a Democrat from Maine. And his personal passion for protecting waterways came from his childhood in a small town called Rumford in Maine, which was by the Androscoggin River. So in the 1880s in the Industrial Revolution, there was this moment where these bodies of water like this one, it was really well known for um, the beauty of what they called the drops, like the waterfalls. And people, of course, you know, we, we, I loved hearing Don talk about protecting the spring, protecting the place where you drink. People were drinking um, and also swimming and fishing and bathing and everything, all of that uh, non-monetizable, non-commodifiable value of that water. But in the Industrial Revolution, um, these different mills and, and, and factories moved in because they saw that they could use the power, the hydropower from those waterfalls, and then would just dump the waste into the water. And so on the Androscoggin River, this happened in the 1880s. And by the time um, Edmund Muskie was growing up in the 1940s, all of this, it was a paper mill in particular. And so they used a toxic, uh, a chemical process to make pulp out of the paper, sulfite chemical process, and they dumped it all in the, in the water. And by the time he's growing up, it was so polluted, it couldn't even support the life of fish or any aquatic life. So he brought that knowledge of that water, his water, just like you all here talking about the water that you know, to this um, task. And, and when he when he went to, um, and of course there were other things that were going into waterways all over, agricultural runoff, raw sewage. Uh, but when he was elected to the Senate, he joined the Public Works Committee and he helped form this subcommittee on air and water pollution, which was formed in, in 1965. So we know everybody's just become coming to awareness about all this during that time. And um, he played a role in passing, passing the Clean Water Act in, of 1970, which Richard, uh, which President Nixon signed. But the Clean Water Act was a really hard fight. And when they had this testimony about it, when people were talking about whether this was a good idea, there was all people speaking up from their waterways, saying what the experience was. There was testimony about the inundation of sewage, the chemicals, the bacteria, the massive fish die-offs, um, the uh, Cuyahoga River near Cle in Cleveland, Ohio had caught fire several times. This was something that was also really um, getting people's attention. And But nonetheless, people objected to the Clean Water Act because they said, the same things that you hear that we hear all the time now. They said it's gonna, it's it's too heavy a cost. It's too big a burden. We need economic growth. We don't want to get in the way of economic growth, um, and so on. And so this bill was in conference for about ten months, and Nixon vetoed it around midnight on October eighteenth. But they didn't give up, and so Senator Muskie went to the floor and he posed this question: the veto message said, just cited the price tag and the costs. And um, Muskie asked this question, a rhetorical question. Um, he said, can we afford clean water? Can we afford rivers and lakes and streams and oceans, which continue to make life possible on this planet? Can we afford life itself? 
And it's such a jarring thing to read that kind of existential question, but that is what they were talking about in deciding to pass this Clean Water Act. And what's so surprising from the standpoint of, of today's politics in a way is that there was a Republican Senator who agreed with him, Senator Howard Baker from Tennessee, who is from the mountainous part of Tennessee, which is very near Virginia. And so what Senator Baker said, um, and they had gotten to know each other on that air and water pollution subcommittee, but what he said when he stood on the floor after this, after this veto message, when they weren't giving up and they were coming together, is he said, quote, as I have talked with thousands of Tennesseans, I have found that the kind of natural environment we bequeath to our children and grandchildren is of paramount importance. If we cannot swim in our lakes and rivers, if we cannot breathe the air God has given us, what other comforts can life offer us? And so hours after the veto, the House and Senate voted to override it. And this became this cornerstone piece of, of environmental law known as the Clean Water Act. So I want everybody to think about um, all of the people in Virginia who feel that way about, you know, what other comforts does life have to offer us if we don't have these waters, if we don't have this air to breathe, if we can't give this to our children and grandchildren, what, what else is there? This is the most important thing. There's so many people that feel that way. Uh, and, and every single one of them should make a comment <laughs> about this pipeline um, because that's, that's what's at stake here. And, and so I'm hoping that, that we can all think of those people and reach out to them and sort of give people a nudge. Also just wanna point out the role of the states in the Clean Water Act is really important. So it's a federal act, the whole national government, but the way they thought about it, the role of the states quality, um, certification process was water quality certification process was very important. And it's precisely for the reason that we've already lifted up today. The people that live with the water, that drink the water, that swim in the water, that fish the water are the ones who know if it's going to be harmed, if it's in harm's way. And so the Supreme Court even has said in a decision, state certifications under section 401 are essential in this scheme to preserve state authority to address the broad range of pollution. Why? Because they said no polluter will be able to hide behind a federal license or permit as an excuse for a violation of water quality standards. So we know that there are these um, ways in which this whole regulatory process has been rigged up. You know, we shouldn't have a situation in which regulated industries dominate regulatory decisions. That's not how it should work. But we know that's how they've been able to hide behind this so far. This is the chance to come out and make the comments so that that, isn't the, that, that, that can't go forward anymore. This is why this movement and all these actions are so important. And so I've read through some of this testimony. I'm really grateful. I'm really, um, like I said, I'm humbled to be here with the people that have been fighting so long for so many years. But some of the testimony I've, I've read, and thank you to you all who provided this for me, Linda Majors of Montgomery County, talking about drinking water. If you allow MVP to cross our source streams with this pipe, she said, you are condemning future generations of, of people that drink this water. Grace Terry from Bent Mountain explaining how many people are concerned says that on, on her part of the route, everyone knows the water is gonna be ruined. And then Donna Pitt of Giles County says that no amount of mitigation bank credits can restore the purity of these waters and wetlands. So we have to listen to these voices. We have to get behind them. We have to have more comments. We have to back them up and take action. And so I just wanna return for a second um, to that story about the Androscoggin River that, um, that Senator Muskie grew up on, because it represents something that happened at that time, that industrial revolution time, where there was this mindset um, that thought it didn't count, like it disappeared. If you dumped waste in the water, it was like an open sewer and it wasn't, it, 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 in the business plan, they don't count it. They call it an externality in the language of economics. And this was, of course, um, a kind of mentality and value system that got a, a big boost from a, a, a colonial mindset. The colonial mindset, which um, was, of course, most vicious and, and really truly deranged 
in its white supremacist ways that, that enslaved people, that, that was involved in genocide against native peoples. It was also had violence against water and land. And um, it's important to, to kind of recognize that there's been this distortion that people have experienced of even their own faith traditions where the, the whole concept of dominion in the book of Genesis has been interpreted to mean domination and domination, dehumanization of some people and then a feeling that all this and all, everything that's non-human deserves to be exploited and dominated. And I think that's in many ways what we're dealing with today. And I, I saw somebody from Interfaith Power and Light of Virginia um, put out a statement on uh, today saying, look, we are called, people of faith are called to be stewards of the land. And that is so important to detoxify that, to get rid of that distortion of that value system because the shared values are there for people to come together. And I also wanna say that when we talk about colonization, keep in mind, we do need to keep in mind the native peoples and thank you so much, Crystal, for, for, for your leadership and for you raising that up and those values and we need to learn from them. But we also have to keep in mind that this whole nation was founded against colonization from the British empire. Why would we wanna let people in tall buildings, you know, looking at balance sheets, stuffing their pockets with money, make decisions about water in local communities. It's just wrong. And the shared values are there to fight back against it. And so basically we can no longer treat the earth <laughs> as an inanimate set of resources to be dominated and exploited. We must embrace a new ethic that treats nature with respect. And it's not just about niceties to say, uh, not just saying that for niceties, it's a matter of survival. So I'm gonna to try to wrap up here in a minute, but I just have to mention that, that in this climate crisis, just like the waterways in the time before the Clean, Air, Clean Water Act were being treated like open sewers, causing these rivers to catch on fire, causing you know, no aquatic life or fish to be able to survive in them. That's how we're treating the Earth's atmosphere. Like it's just an open sewer for all this greenhouse gas pollution. Like we can pretend it doesn't happen when we dump all this pollution into it, but it does happen, you know? And those of us, when we, when we think about those deeper values and ethics and spiritual truths, we know that, you know, that's a teaching of all spiritual and faith traditions that the ways of the world don't always acknowledge the things of real value. And that's what's happening, what we're learning in this whole, in this whole situation. So we can see the effects, this extreme weather events, and we don't have to go through them, but just to mention, I mean, I have a colleague who lives in Portland. It was 116 degrees in Portland, Oregon, you know, with that heat dome. Um, it's never that hot there. Um, in, just in the past months, whenever that was, there's wildfires all on the West Coast. And even in the middle of Tennessee, there was a terrible flooding where people were suffering. And in New York City, where I live, people drowned uh, in basement apartments um from uh from the storm that originally hit the the coast in in the gulf coast from ida and it's just we can see again and again this is a moral issue for a few reasons one is that those who suffer the most are the poor and vulnerable and marginalized people who did the least to contribute to this problem also we can see that future generations of all of us, no matter what our sociological or economic background, all of our, our grandchildren and future generations are the ones that are gonna have this unthinkable burden um, if we continue on this path. So it's also an issue that rests on beliefs and values. You know, science and data and technology are, are important, but they're not enough to deal with this climate crisis. We know that because half the pollution that, that's causing it has gone up there in the last 25 years, which is the time we've known the most about it, known, had the most available alternatives in the form of clean and renewable energies and, um, and also, um, which will create new jobs. And also um, we've had uh, half the fossil fuel infrastructure that's now in place has been built since 2004. So we live in this crazy time in which climate impacts have begun, but we're still pursuing these activities that are causing them. And let's remember this, Mountain Valley Pipeline would have an impact equivalent to 26 typical coal plants or 19 million additional cars. This is, it's gotta stop now. And Virginians can stand up, stand behind their water and, and really 
stop it now and show the whole country. I don't have to tell you all. I'm sorry I'm talking so long. We've got a, I've, I've, I see that Delegate Rasul is here and we really want to hear from him, so I'm going to wrap it up. But, um, but I really believe, you know, one, one more point. Of course, you know, there's this growing awareness and resolve to hasten the shift away from fossil fuels to renewable energy, which of course means that this pipeline is 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 really in, insane is the right word for also from a financial market standpoint. You know, people are warning about the bubble, the pipeline bubble, the instability of financial markets. There's warnings everywhere about that. And the whole world is moving towards this goal of net zero emissions by 2050. So Pipelines live on average, this kind of pipeline more than 50 years. It makes no sense, it can't go forward. And that's one reason why the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis wrote in that report in March, 2021, quote, in the seven years since this project was first proposed, the rationale for the Mountain Valley Pipeline has largely disappeared. And so to bring us back to water, think about this also for the comments. It's about the damage that's happening right now from the construction of this pipeline, which Don and others have really illustrated for us in like heartbreaking detail. It's also that when you cause more havoc in the climate, look what that does to water. Everybody can see in the aftermath of a storm, right? What's What happens, those floods? People are desperate for bottled water to come in because their water systems get messed up. The drinking water gets, gets messed up by that. Um, sewage overflow and so on. And so we, we can stand behind water quality as the way to stop this pipeline. Please keep, keep your energy um, up to everybody uh, who's been in this for so long. Um, thank you so much. There are stories of, of where, um, where there has been a victory over, over a fossil fuel pipeline when it didn't seem possible. We had in, the, in New York State, the Constitution pipeline, this very issue, this 401 uh, certificate, at the last minute, the state denied it and people weren't sure that was gonna happen. And there were people who had their trees cut down, who had their landscape devastated, who went through terrible loss. Um, and they stood and they kept fighting. And it made a difference um, in ending that pipeline. The Bahalia pipeline and Memphis oil pipeline was gonna go over an under, through a, a, a majority, black community in Southwest Memphis over an underground aquifer that supplied Memphis with all of its drinking water and just trying to push it through as these industries do. And they fought back with everything they had. They were gonna take land away from these families who'd owned it since the 1930s. And they they'd paid their taxes on it. They'd taken care of it, just like the landowners that we're talking about in Virginia. The injustice itself is powerful. And so I, I flag those, those, those victories, the Constitution, the Bahalia, but I also want to flag the times when those pipelines had been built because those people fought hard too. And, and I like this quote from, from Martin Luther King. You know, he so often spoke in metaphors of water. So I don't want to overquote him. I'm not going to do too much of that. But this one um, I like uh, because he said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That is why right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. So I know that, that all of you all have felt the weight of temporary defeats and also real loss in this, in this struggle, but I really think we're getting close to the final word in reality on the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And all that unarmed truth and unconditional love that you all have offered is powerful. And standing behind the value of water is powerful. What happens in Virginia matters to the whole country. I don't have to tell you all the weight of the, how large Virginia looms in the political consciousness and history of this country. As fraught as that is, it's very important. And you have the most closely watched political contest in the country right now too. There are a lot of eyes on Virginia. And yet it's Virginians, it's not just the politicians, it's not just the commentators, it's actual Virginians who know and love the land itself, who are the ones that need to speak up now. So thank you very much for leading the way. No MVP, definitely these three really clear actions that have been laid out. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna ask my family who lives in Virginia, a number of them do, uh, to take, and I'm really excited to be in this fight with you and we're gonna win. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was beautiful. Uh, 
Since it's eight o'clock, I've been alerted that Crystal might have to leave us. I, I, I hate that's the case, but I wanted to thank you before you, before you leave Crystal and tell you how valuable it was to have you here. So thank you for that. Um, Ms. Gore has given me more ammunition for a, a short speech here, unfortunately for you all, but I'm gonna make it anyway. Um, I think it's important to understand for people who have not been in the midst of this, of this battle for what, seven years, that there are a lot larger issues at stake here. Of course, this is a climate issue. If we continue to allow infrastructure that's, that's not wise and not needed to keep being put in the ground and keep perpetuating the old system, then that just delays a transition that we have to make now. But going back to the water part, and, and again, I'm gonna tout something that Wild Virginia is behind. We know of the, the huge flaws in the way water is regulated, especially in Virginia. And this pipeline, actually both the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the Mountain Valley Pipeline, the way the state approached them gave a glaring or put a glaring light on those deficiencies of how they do business, how the DEQ and how traditionally the State Water Control Board have done business. And if we cannot get them to make the right decisions on a project that's going to affect hundreds of water bodies, including some of our most valuable, then how do we expect that they will make the right decisions anywhere? And so Winning here, getting them to do the right thing on the Mountain Valley Pipeline is incredibly important, not just for the places that are affected by it, but by the state in general. So I don't care if you care about any water bodies in Virginia, you should care about this because this is about a system that has integrity and works the way the Clean Water Act was designed. The Clean Water Act's obje objective is to um, maintain and improve the chemical, physical, biological integrity of our waters. That means something. But I always go back and say the integrity of the process through which it is applied is just as important. And we're insisting that the way the Clean Water Act and state law are applied to the pipeline and to any other project that affects our water. Um, we need that to work. We need that to be fixed. And we won't stop on that. But you warriors for pipeline, for killing pipelines have helped um, elevate these issues to a place they've never been before in Virginia. Um, I've worked on these issues in Virginia for more than 40 years. Uh, scary to recognize, but it's true. And we are at a place where we can make real change. <clears throat> and so this is a time to do it. Um, now that, that uh, Delegate Razul has arrived, um, I'm going to have the pleasure again of uh, introducing him. Um, uh, as with the other folks that I've mentioned, I can go through credentials, but I, I think more important to tell what, what uh, Sam, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to be able to call him Sam. I think I've known him enough now. Uh, Sam's always there. He always shows up. He always speaks out. He's always been on our side. Um, and and that's, that's what's the most valuable thing to me. Um, and so, you know, we're just, I'm thrilled that you were able to make it, Sam, and I'm excited to hear what you had to say. Thank you, David. Uh, what an esteemed group to be with this evening. Uh, thank you, Wild Virginia, for bringing us together. Um, uh, now, David, uh, you've given yourself away. It sounds like you've been fighting these fights since maybe before I was born. But I digress, uh, the, you've um, been fighting the good fight for a long time. Uh, so thank you uh, to, uh, to you and to Wild Virginia for uh, all that you do, as well as Appalachian Voices. I see some other 
awesome people with Kay Ferguson and Craig and Cynthia, lots of other um, awesome folks. Uh, Russell's our original troublemaker um, uh, in, in a lot of different ways. I was at a reception and this uh, uh, gentleman comes up to me and we start talking and it turns out that he's, he gives me his card and it says Albert Gore the third. I'm like, oh, I started piecing some of this together. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I uh, uh, hear, he's like, what are some of your issues? I say, well, this, that, and the other. And then I realized, oh, this is Al Gore's son. And I told him how passionate I was about we were fighting these two pipelines. This is going back, you know, five years or so, four or five years. He said, oh yeah, my sister fights pipelines. She likes to get arrested, like chaining herself to pipelines. And I said, well, I need to meet this sister. And fortunately, he connected us via um, email. We started chatting a tiny bit. And she's like, well, uh, maybe she was testing me. She was like, why don't you just come on down to Greensboro? We've got this rally with William Barber, with Al Gore and some others. And we're getting uh, folks all across uh, North Carolina uh, who are pushing back. And we showed up uh, and we've uh, fortunately been fighting that good fight um, ever since. So I want to thank Corinna for taking us on uh, and, and saying that the Mountain Valley Pipeline, the Atlantic Coast Pipelines, these are injustices that impact all of us and for showing up time and time again in a genuine uh, way, uh, for sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, you never know where your allies are going to come. Uh, I know she might be off screen right now, but then we started reading about this um, board member, uh, Roberta Kellum, who started uh, pushing back. And I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's pushing back on the inside against the DEQ and nonsense. And, and, and then all of a sudden taking definitive action, um, which uh, we, we really appreciate because we know these are political appointments and it's the governor largely that puts people in these appointments and, and to speak up takes courage. Um, so I, I appreciate you bringing that um, uh, courage to the forefront um, because we were going for a while trying to get the attention of people in the urban crescent uh, that uh, we needed to, to fight this good fight. And look, there's three things that I want to um, talk about real quick with you today to, to make sure that we are pumped up and we are ready to go for this fight. Number one, thank you, Corinna, for bringing in uh, this element of faith. Many of you who probably don't uh, know me very well um, might not know that my faith is very important to me in my service. Um, I really feel as though that there's a higher calling for me to be in public service. And, you know, when push comes to shove and we're making those tough decisions, and I know I'm going to have a lot of negative repercussions on the other side of a decision, I know that in the end, I've got to stand on the right side of history. Uh, and this calling, uh, no matter what uh, is, is your passion or, or strikes that fire, uh, for me, this is an important thing where people can say, we have a higher calling to be able to protect uh, these lands uh, for our children, for ourselves, um, for, for our future, for sure. Uh, number two, this um, one thing that we really struggled with was selective environmentalism, right? And it's, it's like, oh, well, I got a few solar panels and I recycle and you know, this, this really had, you know, killed us for so long in Virginia. It took us years to make people uncomfortable enough to realize we can't just be selective in uh, what we're going to fight for, what we're going to stand up for. Um, and, and look, I get that there are some fights that, you know, some fights are maybe a little bigger than others. But here we are talking about the largest pipeline in Virginia history that is going to be built in a seismic zone. Uh, and then I come to find out that in 2012, uh, the EPA uh, released a study stating that methane, 10% um, of all methane comes from leaky pipelines. Uh, I, I saw a great um, uh, show uh, just in the past few days that said maybe in the short term, uh, one thing that we can be doing uh, because uh, uh, there's a, a, a lot of uh, immediate acts that we can be doing to reel in methane, that that is something that is critical actually to our short-term uh, strategy uh, because of 
uh, the half-life of it and the, the ability to be able to pull it out. And so this is a, a critical uh, fight in, in so many ways. However, we have got to be able to, to go to our friends and say, look, we can't be selective in our envir environmentalism for sure. Number three, one thing that really um, gets to me, you know, I grew up in a working class family and I just grew up not, I mean, maybe hate's a strong word, but I just hate bullies. I cannot stand bullies and MVP every step of the way has been bullying us, throwing their money around, uh, pretending like uh, they can have their way. Uh, and you know what? When we set out, when I, when I got involved in 2015 in, in the fight, I said there are three goals in this fight. Number one is to defeat the Mountain Valley and Atlantic Coast pipelines. Number two is to make sure that nobody runs on the Democratic side statewide again, pro-pipeline. And number three, give them so much, excuse my French, we're going to give them so much hell that no company ever wants to come through Virginia again. And boy, let me tell you, you all have done an awesome job uh, at that. And, and one spark plug, and we've got to give credit where credit is due. David pulled that, that, uh, that picture of me. There was this ornery 61-year-old redhead who was in a tree. And she's like, this ain't happening on my watch. And she was up there for a, about a month. And, <clears throat> you know, things were starting to evolve. And, and, and finally, the judge said, we're going to start fining a thousand bucks a day, this, that, and the other. I said, you know what, Red? If you come out of that tree, if you'd feel like you need to come down, we're going to jump in a van and we're going to march around uh, this uh, state. We did 15 stops in three days and she told her story and she, as well as minor, really gave a face. Uh, they gave their faces to this fight. And all of a sudden people in Northern Virginia and in Richmond, they could connect with this, uh, with this struggle. Uh, and so uh, all because this uh, fiery uh, redhead said that I hate bullies too. And we were going to stand up. Look, these fights are tough. They're long. They're, they, they're, it, you know, at, you have one comment period after another, you feel like, oh my gosh, what, I can't even keep up with it sometimes, right? You, you have this frustration, but let me say this, uh, this time, um, you know, we understand this is not about uh, just the next step. We are rooted. We are rooted in this cause. So believe uh, in this cause, believe in this energy that is happening right now and believe in yourselves uh, because sometimes, sometimes when it seems deep and dark, sometimes you don't know what's coming next. You hear the news one day and they're like, oh, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is no longer, right? And so we, we cherish those days. They, they, they fill our reservoir and they give us the energy to keep going uh, because we know there's a lot of David and Goliath here for sure. Uh, but you know what? I would love to be with this merry band of misfits any day as we're fighting this good fight. So thank you to everyone who is helping us collectively take this action uh, for the, uh, the 27th and just know uh, that I'm uh, proud to be with you every step of the way. Thank you, Sam. So great. You know, I wish we had a big crowd in one place so we could all give these huge ovations, but, but you know you're getting it uh, from, from all over. Uh, just like all these great speakers, um, you know, that um, the, the spirit uh, for us as a collective to still have this kind of determination and spirit and joy. I mean, there's a lot of pain and I don't diminish that at all. But as Don said earlier, to the extent there's joy here, it's working with all these folks, thousands of people who have stood up and who've come out and have showed up. And um, so that, that is something to be proud of. It's something to keep going. And we just have to keep pushing a bit longer. We don't know how much longer, but we can do it. Um, I remember December, 2017, when we had a huge crowd in Richmond and did we ever think we would be here now? Um, I tell you, MVP didn't think we would be here now. 
They thought they'd be done and out the door by now. They thought that thing would be flowing and they were wrong. Um, so nobody, as Sam has said, nobody should say it's a done deal till, till we can't play it anymore. Um, so I want to go, we've been promising a little more specifics about what you all can do in the next week. This is a, a, the most crucial time that we've had in a while because we have that water control board uh, decision that's going to be made. As we've said, there's a comment period that will end on October 27. Uh, you can write and submit those comments to DEQ. And again, we've got links. We're going to send everybody an email who has attended here afterwards. So you have all the links, all the information you need. Uh, and there's plenty of follow up, plenty of places or plenty of information within these documents that gives you good, good uh, examples and good ideas about exactly how to put your comments together. But again, the key is tell what you know, tell what you care about, tell what matters to you um, because that matters legally. It matters under the Clean Water Act. It matters under the responsibilities that the State Water Control Board has. So there is this petition from Appalachian Voices. Um, nobody cannot go and sign a petition. So everybody should do it, period. Um, verbal comments at our people's hearing. We're making it as open, as easy as we possibly can. We're not gonna put all kinds of uh, stipulations and roadblocks in your way like DEQ likes to do. We want you to show up and we want you to make your statement. Um, and finally, writing your own comments. Again, don't be scared of doing that if you've never done it before, you can do it because it doesn't matter what your background it is. It doesn't matter what your training is. You know what, what, how water matters and you know how it's important. So those are the, are the three things that we focused on right now. And those are immediate. Now, there's a little, little note down here beyond. There are more things, and we're going to keep telling you about the next steps and the next steps. Um, but we wanted to focus very clearly and very plainly on what's most immediate. Um, the, let's see. The other things that we've mentioned here, I will just quickly say that related to this Virginia decision is a decision from the Army Corps of Engineers. It's about the same issues, the water body crossings. And I think, frankly, because of all the noise and all the pressure and all the good comments already, the Corps has decided to have their own two online hearings. So that's just another, another place where we can plug in. Uh, don't think about that until the 27th done. Uh, then we'll think about that, but we'll help you on that too. Um, the uh, violation vigil, that's something our friends at Artivism Virginia are heading up. And that's something that's going to happen uh, about the time that the board is going to meet to make their final decision. And it's going to be really great. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be another thing to boost everybody's spirit and show our strength. So look out for those things. I didn't want to ignore them. I just want to make sure we're really focused. So look for the email to follow up. Look for all the advice. And you know where we are. We're always ready to help. 